Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others and the planet. Welcome to episode 98 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. This episode is focused on the book TPM, a foundation of operational excellence. I am so pleased to have with me today the authors of that book, Mr. Peter Wilmont, John Quirk and Andy Brunskill. The knowledge and background in Enterprise Excellence among my three guests is extensive and large. It is such a pleasure to have them on the show with us today to discuss this amazing book and their achievement of the Shingo Prize in recognition. Let's get into the episode. Peter, John, and Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you. So, guys, I'm really keen to know what's the backstory for this book to start to be formed. Perhaps I can start off with this, Brad. Um, I've been involved with TPM one way or another um, for the past 30 years or so. And round about 10 years ago, out of the blue, I had a phone call from John, John Quirk, who said to me, um, I keep coming across the work you've been doing in Ireland. What do you intend to do when you retire? So I said, leave it leave my legacy of TPM. That's the words he used. You know, who are you going to leave your legacy with, which immediately appealed to my huge ego. So I said, well, hopefully in a safe pair of hands. And here we are 10 years later, and that's proven to be the case. I set up really to transfer my knowledge, but on TPM, but it's been a two-way journey of excellence as far as I'm concerned. So it's one of the best decisions I've made. It's it's amazing. And John, your your side of that story, John on the back story. Yeah, well, that, that was basically the story. Um, we were working in many of the companies that you know I heard this guy will not have been in, and he's you know really says it like it is and tells us straight and has been toe to toe with unions and you know keeps it all very simple. Um, we were getting involved more with the Shingo Institute and learning a lot more about, you know, this whole idea of systems and systems enabling behaviors. And that's really what I, where I wanted to bring this whole philosophy around TPM. And, uh, and we hit it off um, and the rest is history. So, um, uh, thanks, Joe. And Andy, I know you've, you've got a massive background in operational and enterprise excellence. Where did you link into the journey with, with the team? Yeah, so I, I mean, I I started off in the industry back a long, long time ago, back in 1988, and I was introduced to TPM and uh, continuous improvement uh, philosophies at you know a, a very, very early stage in my career. Um, I probably came across Peter when we co-spoke at a, a conference, but we didn't actually connect because I got one of my brochures out from many years ago. I think it was in late '98. And uh, he he did actually speak at the uh, one of the conferences I spoke at, and I um, I spent seventeen years in operations management uh, across pharmaceuticals, personal care, and food um, the, the the food sectors, and I joined SA Partners in two thousand and four. Um, so really, when uh, the relationship with Peter uh, started, um, we started working together jointly on a number of projects, and um, you know basically we've been sharing of our you know, our thoughts and our principles over that period of time. And we still have regular contact on a, you know, uh, on, on, a, on a regular basis. So that's really the, the backstory of the, uh, the, the connection with me, yeah, me wow. with the guys. It's an it's a amazing trio with the knowledge and history you, you've all got and then bringing it into this book. Peter, I might, might start with you, Peter, on this. Like, Peter, why, why did you write a book on TPM? Well, how yeah. Did- Okay, um, can I slightly rephrase that and say, go back further and say, what was my light bulb moment for getting involved with TPM? 
definitely, you know, Peter. Definitely. The point, my point of clarity, if you wish. Yeah. You see, I started my working life as a 16-year-old trade apprentice mechanical fitter in the aerospace industry back in the mid-1950s, helping to make Britannias and BAC-111s, so that gives you some idea of my vintage. <laughs> but I didn't make Bristol Bulldogs. I wasn't that old, but uh, that's where I came from. And on reflection some 60 years on from that, that experience proved to be a privilege, right, of, of my ruse. So why is that the case? Well, if we come up to 30 years ago, back in 1992, I headed up the first of what was to become six two-calendar week TPM study tours to Japan. On the first trip, we visited a company called Daikan Industries, who are and still are a recognized world-class manufacturer of, amongst other things, air conditioning units. And at the time, they were an exemplar Japan Institute of Plant Maintenance TPM award-winning company. So as we entered the plant of Daikan um, on our tour bus, we saw that the outside of the factory had been painted with a colorful montage of trees, bushes, flowers, and plants, right? With a message written in both Japanese and English, which simply stated, welcome to our park within a factory. Note, not a factory within a park. So us cynical Brits and European bastions of industry, about 20 of us, slightly skeptically, went in and walked around that plant. And um, the visual impact is still with me to this very day. It was my light bulb moment, especially what was said at the feedback of our tour. But the three things that really hit me there were dedicated rest areas in several parts of the plant. Remember, this was 30 years ago. That had natural wooden seating, running water, uh, natural grass with loads of flowers. And of course, many yucca plants galore. You know, yeah. that was the first thing. The second thing was that there were also large transparent windows in the roof which let in a lot of um, natural lighting and gave the enhanced feeling of space and natural light. And the third telling thing was that everyone appeared to be working harmoniously, not quickly, you know, like the Zen philosophy says, hurry slowly, yeah. but don't stop, you know? It was, it was really quite dramatic. And the TPM facilitator and a small group of enthusiastic operators and maintainers gave a short presentation feedback in the debriefing room after the facility tour. And they highlighted the metrics, which you can see on the screen now, of what TPM had achieved to the business over a six year period. And as that slide shows, it shows that breakdowns per month over the six year had reduced from 250 six years later down to five. The yeah. overall equipment effectiveness across the site had increased from 65 to 88. And using that 65 as a base, you'll see that that's a 35% increase in productive capacity wow. right, over that period. And their productivity index on an index of 100 at the start, six years later, was 180. Wow. Yeah, increase in productivity. And the return on investment was for every US dollar spent over the six years, they got four and a half dollars back. Mm. So that was dramatic yeah. by any metrics. More importantly, perhaps, was immediately after the team presentation, I vividly remember the Japanese managing director then walking up to a flip chart 
and using this slide that's on the screen now. He progressively wrote, in the 1950s and 60s, we had M for manufacturing. Then in the 70s, we had IM, integrated manufacturing. And then in the 90s, which is where we were, 1992, we had CIM. And then he said for computer integrated manufacturing. And then he paused for a moment and he put a circumflex between the C and the I and put H in capitals. And he said, we've decided to reintroduce, as you've seen today, the human being into the workplace. Mm. Wow. That was my light bulb moment. Yeah. So as the illustration suggests here, now on the screen, Chim is no dream, is suppressing reality. And today, 30 years later, my interpretation of that powerful message, that it certainly represents a challenge for all of us to develop and harness our people's skills in parallel with yet more advancing automation, data capture and technological innovation of what we're referring to nowadays as industry four. The bottom line is it's our people that will make the difference. Yeah, that's amazing. So all, you know, and I guess through that tour, Betty, you saw so much, I guess, on that right from the start when you came into the building, mm. because that's all about the human, that environment, and then through yeah. to the results that they've got in the, the H in the CIM. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and it stuck with me. It, it, yeah, as I say, I repeat myself, but it was my light bulb moment, my moment of clarity, yeah. and that triggered me into running another five tours to Japan, but it's not about that. It's about learning by doing. TPM is learning by doing. Hmm. Hey, John, I understand that traditionally TPM is standard for total productive maintenance, focused largely on machine performance and maintenance practices. How has total productive manufacturing expanded on this? So again, it comes back to this idea of... Um, what do we have to be excellent at? And um, having a machine sitting in front of the floor, sparkling, nice and shiny, maintained, looking beautiful, it's not going to do it for you. So the whole idea of expanding it to total productive manufacturing is you're looking at everything that needs to happen around that machine. The supply of materials, the paperwork, the quality checks, everything to do with that machine to make it perform at, at its optimum. So that's why this expansion into total productive manufacturing is, is just this wider interpretation of what we're trying to do. And it could even it could include, and it does include obviously, the training and the skills required to, to run that machine. Because again, that's in, in the world we're in at the moment, that's proven a real issue yeah. uh, where people are getting sick and, and nobody can run the, run the machine. So who, who's number two? If, if number one is, is not available to run the machine. And we've, we've just seen some examples of that just recently this week. Yeah, I can understand that. It really takes the whole focus to that true outcome you're after, which is greater yes. production performance out of yeah. the, What's, the system. Exactly. What's the essence we're trying to do? What, how do we align everything we need to optimize the performance of that piece of equipment? Yeah, great. Thanks, mate. First of all, why the language of four cycles and 11 steps? Yes, again, reflecting on the history, when I joined up with SA Partners eight, nine years ago, it was a uh, nine-step process, purely equipment-based steps, right? And what we did straight away through John's guidance and Andy's we consolidated one of the steps to make it eight equipment steps, as it is now today. And also the sustainment step that looks at the soft, non-technical aspects, which is an audit and review process, um, leadership behaviours. And by the way, John reminded me that one of my colleagues I learned from, a chap called Les, in the offshore oil and gas industry pointed out to me that management get back 
the behaviors that they themselves exhibit. Yeah, that's neat. And that's where the ideal behavior starts. So we have those three sustainment steps for um, the soft cultural issues of audit and review, leadership uh, and direction, and upskilling of uh, our operators, maintainers, and supervisors. Nice, Peter. Really appreciate it. It's 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 an amazing book, and I I so much gained a lot of value myself. Andy, do you mind if we delve deeper into a few of these elements? So, Andy, what what are the steps of measurement, and why does measurement come first? Okay, yeah, sure. So we'll deal with measurement first. So I suppose measurement comes first because we need to know where we are, uh, and measurement is um, is split into three steps the first step is we talk about sources of information and what do those sources of information tell us so what are the various sources that we have in relation to tell us about the equipment its effectiveness um, and we go for a process of the team brainstorming and reviewing the different sources the comprehensiveness the variety and the integrity we then get them to think about you know what's the opportunity to what we call ecrs so what sources can we eliminate what sources can we combine? Or if not, can we at least replace with something smarter or at least simplify? Um, and then the question is, is that, you know, from those sources of information, can we actually extract the metric of overall equipment effectiveness from those sources? Or do we need to design or implement an OEE shift log sheet in order to be able to capture that data relating to OEE, which is step two? So step two is then trying to understand what the overall equipment effectiveness of the asset is. So um, overall equipment effectiveness is split into the availability, the performance and the quality. So part of that process is to be able to cal calculate the current average OEE and calculate the what we call the best of best OEE target, which is delving into the individual elements of availability, performance and quality, and taking what the best achieved was over a period of time, which theoretically says, we've done it once, our issue is consistency, what is that worth to us, if we calculate that and transfer that into productive hours capacity per week, if we achieve that best of best. Uh, and that really that best of best metric helps us really put together a very compelling business case to implement TPM and justify, you know, in particular, step 5B, which is the refurbishment plan. Um, so that's step two. Step three of uh, the measurement cycle is then looking at what are the factors that contribute to that current OEE figure in terms of what we call the floor to floor and the door-to-door -door losses. So we look at what we call the classic six equipment-based losses of availability, performance, and quality losses. And then we start to understand how big are those losses and what's the opportunity. But we also look at what we call the floor-to-floor, -floor, the, the door-to-door -door management losses and the supply chain losses. And what this allows us to do in step three is it allows us to pinpoint the accountability levels for those various stages of losses. So really, that's what that's what the measurement cycle does in, in, in terms of the first cycle of the process. Yeah, Andy, so you, you really getting into the operation and cleaning up the whole measurement approach. Cause I'm guessing sometimes it may not be there or it could be complex or coming from all over the place, getting down to that baseline. But I love how you've defined then what, once you get into OEE, let's just look at what's the best we've done before, because if we've done it before, we can do it again. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, the example we use as part of the workshop and the learning is uh, we look at a golf performance. So, uh, you know, those of us who play golf or are familiar with golf will know that, you know, if we looked at our golf performance over a period of time and selected the best scores we had at each hole, we, we apply that best of best philosophy. Uh, it's great. Our, 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 our problem is consistency, but we've done it once. And what it does is it creates a realistic target for the team. And it's a, it's a measurement that they can own. And, uh, you, you know, we've been really successful in helping teams achieve that as one milestone to target, which has been really uh, successful and uh, enlightening. Yeah. And then, Andy, I, I can understand that wall to wall is about really then understanding the whole equipment across the, the floor. But then you mentioned door to door is then about the leadership ownership and the 
ownership and accountability is above. The, yeah, well, you, you know, uh, again, just only uh, with a client, myself and John were the client just uh, this last couple of weeks. And, you know, you will get losses that the the team who run the asset, the, the operators and the maintainers, if we run out of consumable materials, that's the job of the supervisor, like glue. You know, for the uh, for, for the for the partner, um, that is a that is a management loss. If we haven't got the labour available to run the line, that is a management loss. So what we're trying to do is pick up, you know, the losses in various buckets. The supply chain losses could be the fact that we are unable to uh, procure the uh, materials and have them on site, or we have you know um, uh, bulk mass that fails and is rejected. So what we're really trying to do there is create accountability at the various levels. Uh, for the losses yeah that's neat it, it gets everyone involved everyone who impacts that that equipment and that performance of that operation it's neat yeah yeah hence the sort of total um piece of you know and again whether you're if you're working in manufacturing it may be total productive manufacturing but if you work in a wastewater treatment plant you know they're not manufacturing things and they may call it you know um, asset optimization for example and again tailoring the term of tpm but ultimately it's about today people matter as uh, as john and uh, peter have mentioned before oh, that's neat so andy the this the second cycle is condition like do you mind taking us through that you've got a baseline then of measurement you, you you're starting to understand where the impacts are from wall to wall door to door then it comes down to condition what's that cycle uh, yeah so so the the conditional uh, cycle uh, brad is is again that's split into uh in, into three steps step four five a five b which went from the previous nine step model we consolidated two of the steps into under step five and uh we have step six but basically, the philosophy behind the condition cycle is, is that, um, you know, when I first saw TPM back in the late 80s, you know, one of the things we did is we got we got into it to start doing a deep clean on the equipment. And I, I actually termed this cleaning without meaning. And specifically, step four is what we call a criticality assessment, which is about operators and maintenance co colleagues becoming more equipment conscious, okay? Understanding what the equipment actually does, how it works, and highlighting the impact of the six equipment losses and how they affect availability, performance, and quality as a part of the OEE. And it also helps us understand, for example, if this part of the equipment is in poor condition or failed, what will be the impact on safety, reliability, energy, OEE and environmental impact. So really, this is a piece about equipment conscious so that when I then go into step 5A, which is called the condition appraisal, which we like to call for, you know, the uh, informally, the spot, the rot. I'm now actually going and looking at things where I've I, I have I've got my equip, equipment conscious head on and I'm calibrating that this is a really important asset. And if this is in poor condition or failed, it will have a high impact on safety, reliability or whatever, or, or if it's an, an unreliable piece of equipment. So, for example, something that's uh, in poor condition and uh, um, um, if it was in poor condition and failed to have an impact on safety and it's not reliable, that's an accident potentially waiting to happen. Mm. So what it does is it helps the focus of the condition appraisal. And then step 5B is putting together a refurbishment plan to effectively address the issues but doing it in such a way where we can restore it to as good as new condition, but being able to effectively look at the justification for restoration against what we get back in terms of our best to best, best of best from our, from the exercise that we did on step two. So that's ultimately what the, uh, what step B is about the estimated cost of refurbishment. And then step six, which is about building on, the planned preventive maintenance tasks that may already exist, but also coming up with a plan for what we call frontline operator asset care or flow acts. Uh, we don't tend to call it autonomous maintenance uh, because A, it's difficult to spell and generally autonomous maintenance can sound like a hidden agenda to get the operator to do the maintainer's job, which is this is not. This is appreciating the fact that the person who operates the asset is in the best 
position to pick up signs of deterioration, do some of the simple tasks that they can actually create themselves with their maintenance colleagues. And these tasks may take you know, usually less than 10 minutes, validate and update the PM schedules and use of visual indicators, um, and then validate the fixed intervals of maintenance and our PM schedules. Um, and also look at the opportunity for what we call condition-based monitoring um, opportunities and a comprehensive review of the Spurs policy. So there's a lot in step six, but what we're doing is we're making the connection between our criticality, our condition, the refurbishment we've carried out, and effectively, how do we maintain once we've got the uh, equipment restored in its optimum condition? So that's a, that's a really a, a brief overview of, of, uh, of the uh, condition cycle, Brad. It's really Good, Andy, because I guess what you've described there comes back to the whole human factor because right from the start, you're talking about maintenance and the operators, you know, analysing the equipment to understand the criticality of it and aspects more holistically, including environmental and safety and aspects like that. And then you're bringing it through to them, ultimately getting to the place where they're understanding what needs, finding what needs to be repaired, refurbished and brought back up. And then all parties are working on the maintenance and the and the support of that equipment. Yeah, and there's an interesting sort of um, mindset there in that, you know, if I create a check sheet for an operator, you know, the probability is he'll tick the boxes maybe at the beginning, at the end of the shift, because he's not been involved and engaged in the creation of that. And we've not shown him respect of the operator who runs that asset every day. Whereas we involve the operator and their maintenance colleagues in the creation of that, um, they will carry that out because it's been devised by themselves and we've engaged them and we've, uh, we, we, we've got them involved in that whole process. And that's a really important differentiator of what we're doing uh, as part of the condition cycle. Yeah, that's neat. That's neat. I love, I think there was a saying I saw once, um, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I might remember, involve me and I'll understand. You let me innovate, I'll actually master it. Oh, there's another. That's awesome. That's yeah, another level that's part of, it. of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Go to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast.com backslash downloads to get a hold of some additional short videos Peter, John, and Andy have provided on TPM. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help others gain insights and create a better future. Let's get back to the show. So, Andy, the, the cycle that I'm keen to explore with you is, is problem prevention. So this is the ne next element of it. What is problem prevention about? What's involved there? So it, it's the third cycle. It's the third cycle of the, um, of the eight equipment steps. So as Peter mentioned before, you know, the 11-step model is, is, is split into three cycles. The first three cycles cover the eight equipment steps. And, um, you know, the, the third cycle, the problem elimination cycle, is, is, is two two steps, which is step seven and step eight. And really the philosophy behind um, the step seven and, and uh, it, step seven really is it's about the prevention and reoccurrence of problems. Um, and, you know, we don't want to be doing temporary, uh, temporary quick fixes because effectively, you know, if we don't actually get to root cause of problems, problems will come back. And, you know, we, 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 we based on based on very good data that we've collected over the years, we say that, you know, for every 100 events that may happen to an asset, 90 percent, we can say this has happened before. In fact, 95 percent, we can say this has happened before. Five percent, we can only hand on heart say, Do you know, this is the first time this has ever happened. So step seven is about using problem uh, analysis techniques uh, such as uh, um, 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 definition, root cause analysis, um, to understand the six equipment-based losses, to so drill down based on the data that we collect collected in part of the measurement cycle. And it may also be opportunities that we saw as part of the condition cycle. But the idea of using what we call the PM mindset, okay, so the four Ps, Okay, of uh, and the six M's. Okay, or so the, the classic six M's that we see as part of our our, our fishbone, our issue hour, is about getting the team to 
drill down the losses, use problem-solving techniques such as ASY five times, DIMAIG A3 and FMEA tools to ultimately deliver the 100-year fix. And what we do tend to find is that we work with different businesses that their maturity of problem solving can be, you know, quite mature to, you know, middle to, to, not, to not particularly mature. So what we're trying to effectively do is integrate step seven into their current problem solving process. But ultimately, what we're trying to do here is make dynamic problem solving part of the tasks that the operators and maintainers do as a team as part of their tier management process which is really important okay and then step eight is really about you know einstein's definition of insanity you know we could we could talk about that reference that in terms of step six and step seven and eight is that once we've come up with a solution we need to be able to put that into best practice because um, if we put that into best practice and we have one best way, it means that um, that we can actually, that's one of the ways to be able to uh, make sure that our problem prevention resolution is sustained, um, which is part of the control phase within DMAIG, for example. Um, and it's about making those single point lessons very visual, created by the operators and the maintainers, and then linking them to a training skills matrix to give recognition. And it's a natural lead to define standard work. So to really that's sort of a little bit of a flavor of what we do on step seven and eight. I think it's um, so great, Andy, that you've brought that whole problem prevention in, especially delved it out so much, bringing it down into quality and training and visual work instructions and all that. You know, it's things that can get forgotten or missed or be really weak in many places but it's such at the heart of it isn't it absolutely uh, and the, the other thing again is that you know it's the engagement of the operators the maintenance the line teams in creating those single point lessons so they're not created by the quality control department yes of course qa will be involved because they're a vital team member as part of our tpm journey but again we're giving the ownership accountability and we're showing that sort of uh, humility and respect to 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 everyone in terms of the roles they 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 have within the uh, within the company yeah well i guess really when it comes down to the operators know best because they're running it day in day out aren't they they know they're there with it know it and the maintenance personnel working on it too john and what what are the steps of the fourth cycle sustainment so the, the sustainment piece is really around this idea of building the um leadership piece the training pieces the pieces around leader standard work. So what do we need to do to regularly um, inspect and improve? And again, not not do the red conversations. Like we're, we, we, that, that's not a sustainable environment. So how do we have both the green conversations and then the, opportuni the opportunities for improvement conversations? So the four steps in, in, in the fourth part of the model are all involved in um, enabling that to happen. And most importantly, it's giving people, leaders in particular, um, the ability to have the right sort of conversations at the right time. So when I'm at a um, improvement board, when I'm working with the team on solving a problem, when the machine isn't performing well, am I going in with the red conversation or am I going in with the conversation? Okay, here's a chance to understand what's going on here. Here's an under, here's a chance to improve what's happening, um, improve a procedure, um, learn something we didn't know already. So that's the sustainment piece is really all about putting those peeps, those steps in place. I love that language you're using there around the red conversation, the green conversation, like what you really, yeah. am I right? And what you're saying is that our approach and our language will either turn a situation so, to this flaming red fight or flight type of situation or a green yeah. growth behavioral. Yeah, outcome. exactly. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the old behavioral psychology stuff. I mean, if you're, you're having the wrong, wrong red conversation straight away, all the blood is going, away from the parts of the brain where we need it and we turn into a lizard and we're trying to find a place to hide yeah. um, whereas if we have the positive green conversations we're in that rich part of our brain where we can think we can problem solve and and that's a skill sometimes and sometimes leaders don't even know they're having that conversation 
And it's such a visceral thing for leaders in particular when a machine is just standing there looking at them doing nothing or doing the wrong thing. And it's so obvious that this is a wrong situation. It's very easy to fall into that language. Whereas um, if we can say, okay, let's take a step back. What do we want to do here? How do I want these people to feel after I've had these conversations with them? Do they want to feel disappointed and dejected and feel their failures? Or do I want to feel, make them into mini scientists where they've suddenly discovered something new about their process that they didn't know before? And there, that's the sort of green conversations you, you, you want to ha- try and have with your people, not only associated with, with machinery failure, but also with them um, any failure within an organization. We, we, we need to encourage green conversations. We need to challenge, obviously, accountability and ownership. But the more green conversations you have, you don't have to have those conversations because people take it on. Um, they're, they're not afraid. Um, they're interested. They're engaged. They're learning. Whereas, um, you know, this thing about, um, oh, nobody's accountable. It's, it, nobody's accountable because they're scared of their life that uh, something will go wrong. Yeah. So they're doing everything in their way to, to avoid it or, or hide it in that type of piece. Yeah. John, what with the learnings and what, you and the team have written about with total productive manufacturing, what stops organizations actually implementing this and achieving the results from it, from what you've seen? Um, so the, the main um, issue is really around this idea of what do we have to do? Um, so if, if our making product, if the quality of our product, if the performance of uh, our delivery, our, um, profit that we make is all dependent on the performance of a piece of equipment. Well, then every part of the organization needs to be aligned to that essence of what we do. Um, so the quality group can't over complex um, uh, changeover processes. They, they, we, we can't, um, uh, you know, we can't have multiple checks or multiple checks, uh, um, which we know the data is all telling us that this is very unlikely to happen, but we still we still do all the checks. Um, we can't be um, taking people away from the equipment for non-value add training, you know, or, or you know, or um, so the, the, the issue or we're still we try and penny pinch on on maintenance spares or why do we need that belt we can get this belt from china or the back of wherever for half the price uh, of this guy who's selling it down the road and um, so we, we make mistakes around how we align as an organization to optimize the essence of what we do and that's the biggest challenge you know people say oh i'm i'm, I'm not involved in the equipment i'm i'm, I'm a quality person you know or i i'm you know i'm uh, whatever procurement person my job is to get the cheapest price and blah 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 or i'm the operations guy and why the hell is it maintenance cost me so much um, um so it's that alignment of thinking around the essence of what we're trying to do the money in your pocket if it depends on the performance and the quality of that equipment well then the whole organization you know i'd say they need to list off nearly all the bits of the equipment it's like a um, going to a, a restaurant and asking a, mate, a waiter what's on the meal and they don't know what's on the menu and they don't know. So every person in, in that organization needs to know every part of those ingredients that align to give you that, that perfect meal. And that, that, that can be a gap. That, that piece of equipment makes or breaks the value we deliver to customers, depending on how healthy it is. We need to treat that piece yeah. of equipment like a customer from every angle, no matter what your division you sit in. Is that yeah. what you're saying, John? Yeah, yeah exactly. If you're, your whole family and whatever you want to do in the future is going to depend on the performance of that equipment. Um, it, that's the way you think. It, it's, it's, you know, it's like your oxygen. Yeah, that's it? neat. Just... Building on what John said, if I may, uh, and slightly turning it around, not instead of John's answer, but quite often in response to what stops organizations implementing these key learnings was your question. Over the years, I've often been asked a salutary question, how many successful TPM applications have you been involved in? which is a good question. 
And I say, before I answer the question, I need to clarify by asking you, by success, do you mean having helped, say, 100 companies over the last several years to get their TPM program up and running? And then I go back five years later to see if TPM is still part of the way we do things here. Um, around you? If so, the answer is probably in the range of one to five. Why is that the case? Mm. Yeah. And the answer is that you can glibly say, ultimately, that success and sustainability depends on leadership. Yes, it does. But it's a bit more complex. And over the years, it's been my privilege to be involved in many debates like this, but also through some research as well on any change program of continuous improving, including TPM. And the sixth reoccurring thing is lack of clear, consistent leadership and direction, which in my experience is the number one offender, okay, but not the only one. It's a lack of thorough planning, preparation, measurement, and feedback at the outset. And the change program has no clear vision or end game. What's the end game of doing this? Or poor, inadequate, inconsistent, and ineffective communications. Some companies communicate like hell, but is it effective? Yeah. Is it the right things? Are, are you a good listener you know, as a leader? And the final one is unclear roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and expectations. So they're reoccurring themes from wow. what I've come up. And I guess with your the background of John, Andy, and yourself, Peter, like the, the background knowledge that you've got and what you've seen, it's so great to hear that and get that insight you know, it's such great knowledge for us to consider with other companies that are looking at transformation right now, looking to bring in TPM, looking to get better outcomes out of assets or equipment, engage people more effectively. It's I'm really hearing in the conversations that whole, you know, consistent vision, consistent approach, a feedback and reflection and adaption approach, you know, the need for measurement and be able to track and measure and monitor that towards a clear vision and outcome. Like there's so much great stuff in all that. Peter, for yourself, what, what would be a, a two-minute tip that you would give to an organization on this around TP? Okay, yeah, a two-minute tip. One thing that Andy mentioned, right, was the OEE best of the best. We didn't mention a world-class OEE. The book dispels some of the myths around the fact Many six myths, but one of them is that 85% is a world class OEE. The problem is, 30 years ago, whatever it was, we didn't let the Japanese gentleman who said that finish off the statement. He, we ran out the room without listening to his uh, actual statement. He said, world class of 85% is typically for a manufacturing operation that has significant number of changeovers, yeah? You, and what Andy is saying is we have to look inside the OE and come up with an interim target of the best of the best. To answer your question, the other second point is, for me, TPM allows the leader to take the vision and values off of the notice board hand it to the operators and maintainers and say with conviction, say with our proactive, visible and ongoing support, you can make a difference because we're going to ask your opinion about the best way of doing things here. Nice. That's a great, that's a great insight and tip. And it's a great visual you gave us there too, Peter. Like that just clearly painted the picture of my mind of that leader taking that vision, taking the values and behaviors, the values and going down and going, okay, we want to work together. We want to partner with you and work with you to help us all make a better outcome here. 
It's neat. They're probably wear a garlic round their neck and, and make the sign of the cross because they may not believe them to start with. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's it depends on the behaviors of the past, doesn't it? Like I was in yeah. um I was in a meeting running some coaching and support with a company the other day. And the leader was sitting in there. He was being very respectful and very engaging. And there was a lot of stuff coming up. And I was like, wow, great behaviors. And then later on the day, the leader wasn't there. And it, people were saying, oh, this place, you know, leadership don't trust us. And we got no voice. And they're just telling us what to do. And I said to him, when? I haven't seen that from the leaders in the room here at the moment. Oh, they don't do it too much now. But when was it happening? Oh, you know, three years ago, oh, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. But it hangs around so long, doesn't it? Like it is. That's why these journeys aren't quick, are they? Because it takes a long time to uncrumple that paper. Exactly. Yeah, just a quick comment on that. Mm -hmm. Cultural change is evolutionary. But TPM yeah. can speed up that process in the right hands. Industry 4 is revolutionary. Yeah. It's amazing what's coming through now and it's in action, isn't it? It's yeah. it's being done right now. It ain't now. gonna go away. No, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks guys. Now, guys, how can people get hold of the book and how can they reach out and connect with you if they wanna learn more? Well, you can, uh, the book is available. Um, uh, you can order direct from ourselves, com. It's on um, Amazon distribution. Um, um, networks um, and certainly you can contact us at sapartners.com um, um, we all are on LinkedIn uh, so it's not too hard to find us yeah well thanks so much guys well guys I really appreciate your time thank you for joining us and sharing your knowledge and helping us create a better future I really appreciate it no problem thank you for the opportunity right, Pleasure. Sorry, thank you thanks Brock see you guys what a great episode. Remember, you can go to our website, enterpriseexcellencepodcast.com backslash downloads to get hold of some additional short videos Peter, John, and Andy have provided on their approach to TPM. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help others gain insights and create a better future. There were two key takeaways for me from this episode. Firstly, the power of involving everyone in the process of TPM within an operation. Everyone from operators to maintenance to scheduling, have a part to play in achieving operational performance, particularly with machinery. Building transparency and collaboration within these differing teams is such an important step for improving culture and ultimately machine performance. The importance of purpose is my second key takeaway. Having something the team believes in creates motivation and drive towards the goals they are chasing. Purpose and meaningful goals is a common topic many of our experts talk about on the podcast. If teams can find a purpose for what they do and leaders lead this well, it creates a level of commitment and energy that is otherwise unachievable. Thanks again for your time and knowledge, Peter and John and Andy. Thanks for writing such an amazing book that is truly helping us create a better future. Bye for now.